Orlando Ori Spado was born on December 17, 1944, in Rome, New York, where he attends high school at Rome Free Academy. At the age of 18, Ori joins the U.S. Army and serves his country proudly, and is discharged honorably in 1966. He returns to Rome and has various jobs until he sells insurance for the Prudential Insurance Company, where he is a leading agent. After his marriage and three children, Ori moves to San Francisco, where he marries his second wife, and then, after another divorce, he moves to Beverly Hills, California. Here he becomes known as the Hollywood mob boss, enjoying a friendship with the legend underboss Sonny Franchisi of the Colombo family for over 40 years, a friendship that remains to this day. In his new book, The Accidental Gangster, Mr. Spado tells the true story of his life. He lived it, he owns it, and takes full responsibility for the actions of his past. You can pre-order your autographed copy at theaccidentalgangster.com while supplies last. I've already purchased my copy, so don't delay. A link can be found in today's show notes. In the 1980s, it seemed like organized crime had reached a golden age. Long gone were the days of the Castle Morese War, and the five families of the Commission had enjoyed a long run of prosperity. They had overcome the vicious public street wars that horrified a nation and began to focus on Luciano's vision of a much bigger picture. FBI Director Edgar Hoover denied the very existence of the Cosa Nostra, even as their tentacles extended to virtually every lucrative market imaginable. The men at the top were untouchable, insulated and protected by several layers of underlings whose small-scale brutality ensured their wealth and survival. In the vicious slums of East 100th Street, Harlem, a man known as the Doctor had come through it all. A short, squat man with piercing blue eyes who came to prominence as a protege of some of the most notorious gangsters of the 1920s. A man who had worked his way up the rackets and was involved in gambling, bookmaking, narcotics, loan sharking, and extortion. A man whose manipulative and corrupting skills were without reproach as early as 1941, when a conviction for selling over $150,000 worth of heroin only begot a six-month sentence. A man whose pension for intimidation and violence was exceeded only by his ability to elude prosecution. This is the legend of Anthony Tony Ducks Corello. I wouldn't know a gunman if I saw one. Gangster era stuff. Time feuds of public enemies bring a reign of terror and baffle police. How did this famous gangster treat you? He treated me wonderful. This is what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing. This is my doom, 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 doom. doom. I can see him like standing in front of the butcher shop. They're like looking at this this hot dog vendor. <laughs> there he is down there. Yeah, he's watching. Look at that grin on his face like he knows what he did. <laughs> I'm going to take that grin off his face. I tipped him a quarter once. <laughs> so thanks, I get. I'm going to get it back. <laughs> so the question uh, remains, do you have to be killed to be a legendary gangster? No. And, and you can't count Luciano because he's like the exception yeah, to every rule. That's true. Oh, uh, Capone, right? You're right, but uh, Capone went out with a whimper. <laughs> well done, Zach. You killed that conversation. <laughs> Never Speaking saw that of, movie about Capone. No, that came out this year. Which one? With Tom Hardy. It's a, yeah, it's about Al Capone, like at the end, end of his life. End of his life when he's like shitting himself, losing his mind, doesn't know who he is. Yeah. The FBI is yeah. watching him to see if he's faking it or not, and he is not faking. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when it comes to Tony Ducks, I remember that Fear City, and uh, they showed him a lot in that and stuff. And uh, yeah, he's a different kind of gangster. He wasn't flashy. You know, he looks like, uh, almost like Delaney did at the end. You know, he was just kind of putzing around town. And yeah. uh, he's not the guy you would think if he bought a sandwich from you or something. That, that he looks like a, a businessman. Like the pictures I've seen, he just looks like a, yeah. a regular guy, like an accountant or... Yep. Yeah, but not even a Wall Street business guy. No, yeah, no. just like a normal... Yeah, like a local accountant or something like that. Yeah, like a $20 shirt kind of guy. Yeah, so in Fear City, they went on about trying to bust these guys and the frustration of busting them. 
And this is where Rico came in because they're chasing these guys around all the time and they're following them and they bust a guy, they bust a soldier and so what? Now he's done, he goes to jail, he's in jail for a year or two and there's a hundred guys that are happy to take his place and the frustration is so high with these guys. And this is in the 80s. It's Giuliani that kind of comes in and introduces Rico, which they already had. You know, Rico was set up to get groups of people and to get them on conspiracy charges. They just didn't enforce it or something? They didn't understand it. Yeah. They, none of the cops understood it. And actually, in the Fear City, they have this huge meeting where this lawyer is explaining to them what Rico is and how it's supposed to be used. And, they're, and then it looks like the light comes on. Because yeah. they're like, you don't have to get him. You only have to prove that he's associated with him, yeah. that the money is changing hands, and there are conversations. Rico's a slippery slope. To get a warrant on Zach, you could get three guys just to say Zach is involved. Yeah. Just to mention his name on a tape, and Zach's part of the Rico thing. You get pulled in. So it's pretty easy to enforce. It's yes. Because they kind of knew, but they thought, yeah, they thought to get everyone, you still needed a top guy. They thought it was still that way, where if I get the big guy, then I can get all the big guys. But it was the opposite. Yeah, they they could start at the bottom and go all the way up. You you could just get a soldier, and he's on tape mentions that he's going to go talk with Masseria tomorrow. Now he's in. Now he's like, now we got Masseria, and he's in a location that I have one screwed. Yeah, so RICO, uh, to anyone that doesn't know, it's the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. It's R-I-C-O, RICO. So it's passed in 1970. It says, uh, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act is a federal law designed to combat organized crime in the United States. It allows prosecution and civil penalties for racketeering activity performed as part of an ongoing criminal enterprise. Such activity may include illegal gambling, bribery, kidnapping, murder, money laundering, counterfeiting, embezzlement, drug trafficking, slavery, and a host of other unsavory business practices. To convict a defendant under RICO, the government must prove that the defendant engaged in two or more instances of racketeering activity and that the defendant directly invested in, maintained an interest in, or participated in a criminal enterprise affecting interstate or foreign commerce. The law has been used to prosecute members of the mafia, the Hells Angels motorcycle gang, among many others. So if you're watching Fear City, this is when the light goes on and they decide they're not going after these low-level guys anymore. Like one guy said, oh, I'm going to need 50 guys, and they're like, give him what he needs. And they just get the board up, and they've got all the pictures of the guys and the capos and going down, and they attack all five families at one time, right? The biggest problem they have is they can't get anybody to testify. This is when wiretaps come in. So they're like, you know what? They're going to testify against themselves. And that's when, and, it, and they just get really, really smart. And that, that kind of brings us to the 80s and to the situation with Tony Ducks. I mean, the 80s and uh, really until Gotti got put away. So the last time, I mean, Brett was saying on the way here, Gotti was like the last one. Yeah. The last guy that was like in the, the traditional sense. In the consciousness. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it was before the criminals were very smart and very organized. And it's not that the cops were stupid, that yeah. they were not organized and they didn't have the big vision and plans that the, that the criminals had. Now it's flipped. They've got the technology. And this is in the 80s. Forget it now with internet yeah, no and way. drones and God knows yeah. what they can do. How do you get away with it anymore? Yeah. Is there any room for the mob now? Yeah. You can't even... Like, if Zach and I were in a gang and connected, I don't think I could foreseeably be in the same county as Zach. I would only be able to call through a payphone. If Zach and I were in the same, like, past each other, yeah. they could connect us. I'd have to only call through payphone or have someone be a mediator and hand a physical note. Anything with technology, th- they could get their hands on Good that. Good luck finding a payphone. Yeah. Yeah. You need a cash business because computers mm-hmm. trace money, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. Can't use PayPal. Yeah, I, I could not be have a face to face one on one conversation with Zach. I don't think ever. No, because they would be wall. If they had any inkling that I was involved, they would immediately start following me or having an eyeball. I could never be in the same room as Zach. Can we even do fax communication? <laughs> like, 
just to just to talk is such a they struggle. They tap our fax machine too. Before we even get to the actual crime or business, just to communicate with Zach in the 21st century would be such a hurdle to get through. Son of a bitch, we could do the telegraph. <laughs> Bring it back. Nobody's nobody even knows Morse code anymore. <laughs> Yeah, just yeah, just beep 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 beep. Bring beep, back beep, a dead beep. language. Can you see some millennial <laughs> FBI guy going? What the hell is that? <laughs> They're using some form of archaic communic. <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> Playing a damn video game all day long. <laughs> <laughs> we might be onto something. Yeah. Something that occurred to me, you know, without getting too far into it, all the riots and things going on right now. You know, and the police are hauling ass. They don't help and stuff, and people are like unprotected. I'm like, oh, you need protection. <laughs> <laughs> Pay me a fee, my boys are not protective. They're always in the protection business, only I think the caveat this time would be they would actually have to protect you. There's somebody to protect you from. Usually you're, yeah. they're protecting you from them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, but maybe the rioters could be the next mob, you know what I mean? Because it's, <laughs> it's chaotic and uh, how much are you going to pay to not have your store torched? Yeah. Right now. <laughs> and that money's not going to be traceable. So, I don't know. I keep thinking like... Uh, Maybe the, the days of huge corruption are gone, yeah. but maybe it just falls back into small, loose gangs. and Yeah. Yeah, I, maybe there's, like, some neighborhoods in New York where the mob still has a presence, but, like... It's like, definitely, like, like, town to town, neighborhood to neighborhood, but, the, yeah, the influence they had is gone. The, Especially... The, Tony Doug's is the construction. That's not happening anymore. Mm-hmm. The allure... Okay, well, there's unions, though. Do you think the unions are straight up? No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want to look at it, I mean... There's still a Hoffa. To around, get to that right? political <laughs> sense, you could look at the politics as the mob now. Yeah. Because they kind of do the same shady oh, stuff. Oh, and always but, have been. Yeah, they're yeah. alive and well. They're stealing yeah. their money, and there's yeah. nothing yeah. you can do about the it. The traditional way you look at it is gone, but yeah, I would say it's definitely as alive and thriving. You thought Tammany Hall was extinct. No, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, they're, they're, still, they're still definitely still in. Yeah. If there's money there, they're there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, welcome to Partners in Crime. Once again, I am still Bill Crooks, your host. Sitting to my right, he hasn't been to a topless bar since the feds announced the coin shortage. That was his tipping money. It's Zach the Zip Griffith. (laughs) Missed the days of the coins, man. (laughs) And across the table, a man who hasn't slept since he found out they're remaking Godfather 3. He's a sucker for the silver screen. It's Brett Sexton. (laughs) Need to get my rest. Wakes up in cold sweats. So three. <laughs> and lastly, he may be a minor in the eyes of the law, but he's a major pain in the ass around here. It's Joshua the Intern. You know, if you're going to be a smart ass, you have to at least be smart. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just an ass. <laughs> he has a point. Wow! <laughs> so before we get uh, too far into uh, Godfather 3, I mentioned it in the intro. So I guess he's going to uh, hash it up. He said he's going to mix it up a little bit. It's uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's true. It's a big, uh, on the Instagram yeah. gangster pages and stuff, everybody's hot about it. Yeah. So what do you think of that, Brett? We're in the age of just redoing stuff. If you didn't get it right the first time, I guess they're going to let you redo it. I don't know. I mean... Justice League, Brett. Yeah. I'm excited because of how much I love The Godfather to see... What a vision that he might not have gotten to fulfill would look like. But I mentioned earlier that that gap was so long that I don't think Godfather 3 was ever going to be as successful as 1 and 2 because you waited so long. The fanfares died down. The hype has died down. The fanfare might have literally died. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some of those original older fans were, are not around to see any. Yeah, I was a kid. Yeah. So I still remember. But yeah, probably anybody that was my age now is dead. Yeah. I just don't get it. It was kind of like Coppola. Nothing else to prove. Maybe this is just he's so passionate about how it it wasn't that good. He could be sitting around in quarantine in L.A. I don't know where his house is at or where he's at, but maybe he has all this time and he's just got to thinking like, damn, I really I really wish I could have really done something different. With, well, I got all this time. Might as well yeah. just fix Godfather 3. <laughs> so he's like 80 now. He's so, so, Zach, were you implying that there was nothing wrong with Godfather 3 and he should have <laughs> left it alone? <laughs> No, no, no. no. no per- a perfect movie in Zach's Plenty house. wrong with Godfather 3. Uh, Simply casting his daughter. Not getting Duvall back. Not getting Duvall back. was, a... But yeah. the thing with Duvall was he wanted a lot of money to come back. 
And they were they were already paying Pacino and Keaton too He much. wanted, like, Pacino money. Yeah. And he wasn't going to be the Pacino role in so part three. They were just like, we'll kill off Tom, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if you made a really good movie, the money would be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I don't know how much money that movie made. Probably a lot, right? Uh, not. I don't know about the long run. Like, I don't even see it on TV much. You get the, well, it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to show part three when they can just do one part. Notice one or part on two. AMC when they have the Godfather marathons, they never show three. Yeah. But, <laughs> did it really suck, or does it just not stand uh, up to the to the previous? I think that's the. If it was a standalone yeah, movie, probably right? that. It's probably more that than it just sucks. Yeah, if I saw a standalone gangster movie where a helicopter went up and shot the room out and all that stuff, and the girl died at the end, I didn't think she was that bad. It's just comparatively. Especially, like, the hype immediately coming off part two. People are like, this is the greatest yeah. movie. It's the greatest gangster movie we've ever seen. I cannot wait for the end to this trilogy. And then you kind of get that. It makes it seem yeah. like the worst movie ever made when it's clearly not. It's not. I mean, it was nominated for Best Picture. Whatever that says, <laughs> anymore. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know. Like, good. It was a. It was tough because Goodfellas came out that same year too. So it wasn't even the best mom movie of that year. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. 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 So I mean, and like, even if it came, if it came out in the '80s, it still would have been better because it would have only had maybe like a Scarface to yeah stack up against. And Scarface is so different from your typical mob gangster movie. But Scarface would have been considered better. Scarface would have been better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and what about the line where he's like, "They pull me back in." That's a great line. It's like a, probably his most iconic line, right? Is Pacino's. it or is it a joke? It keeps. I mean, they mention it all the time in Sopranos, <laughs> especially do, yeah. early in season one. Yeah. Constantly, they're just like, "And as soon as I thought I was out, <laughs> they pull they me pull right me back in." He says it like thirty times in the first three episodes. It could be some overacting from Alba. I don't care. Yeah, I think it was. I, I, just, I don't know if like we're admiring that line or for like, "Wow, did you overstep that one?" You know, Al. You gotta love Al. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought he was good in it. I liked it. You know, I mean, I think so. I, I liked the movie. It just, I guess to me, the second one was better than the first. Yeah. And the first was amazing. And it's like, man, they doubled down. When they brought De Niro in. Yeah. You know, who wanted to be in the first one? Yeah. He yeah. wanted to be Sonny. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, man. And James Caan got it. That's a what if. Yeah. yeah. Well, I actually yeah. saw the uh, De Niro trying out for it and stuff. It's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, when they brought him in and he ended up getting such a bigger role and he killed it. Yeah, you know what? What a great thing. So I, I think that was the problem with three. It's yeah, I guess. Well, what do you think of the Pope storyline? The, <laughs> the Vatican storyline. Yeah, I barely remember it. Killing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the Pope died. It's been a few years since I've seen. Yeah. Oh yeah, they yeah. had to kill him. The whole, like, the, Pope. the whole, the whole right? like montage yeah. sequence. Yeah, yeah. Killed the Pope. Well, on the record, I'm against killing the Pope. <laughs> Guess anyone is wondering. Me too. <laughs> yeah, that's that's never going to be my favorite scene. But, but I think. I, but I, I gotta admit, I actually forgot they even did that. <laughs> You're probably not the only one. I just think it's not that it sucks. It's that it sucks in comparison. The bar is astronomically high for that third movie. Because yeah. if somebody tried to tell me the first two Godfathers are the two best movies ever, I'd be like, okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're probably right. So, so if they say Godfather 3 is one of the best, then you're going to, like, Baker act them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to push back. You call it 911? <laughs> I'm going to push back on yeah. them. Yeah, right. Yeah, based on the fact that I have forgotten major plot lines in it, maybe it wasn't <laughs> that good. Or maybe I'm just you know, getting old. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Antonio Anthony Corallo was born on February 12th, 1913, in the East Harlem neighborhood of New York City. Little is known about his early life, although by the ripe old age of seven, Carlo knows exactly what he wants to do with his life. That year, in 1920, the mobster to be joins up with the 107th Street Gang in his hometown of East Harlem. Seven. Seven years old. Knew, knew what he wanted to do with his life. I want to be a gangster! <laughs> <laughs> how, do, how do you even get there? What went to wrong? To that point at seven. What went wrong? Was his dad a gangster? Oh, I'm sure he thought about being a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't be a pirate, so might as well join the mob. We're in New York. You can't be a pirate. Be that other thing. Oh, a mobster. Okay. Yeah, that. The 107th Street Gang is no stranger to up-and-coming hoodlums. 
Formed by American Mafia legends Tommy Lucchese and Lucky Luciano, the gang specialized in stealing wallets, burglarizing local stores, along with other illicit activities. Operating under the supervision and protection of Gitano Tom Reyna, a Bronx East Harlem family boss, Carallo and company have little to no concern about running into trouble with rival gangs or law enforcement. One of Reyna's crowning achievements is an ice distribution racket that is extremely lucrative. According to Tom Jones of Gangsters Inc., Carallo soon works his way up in the rackets and is involved in gambling, bookmaking, narcotics, loan sharking, and extortion well-rounded portfolio for any budding gangster. His money lending skills are legendary and at one time he is known as a loan shark's loan shark. Corello's first run-in with authorities comes at age 16 in 1929. He's charged with grand larceny but is never convicted for the crime. This will become the first in a long line of crimes that Corallo never faces the consequences for. Corallo is being brought up in a precarious time for organized crime. The leader of his gang, Reyna, is caught between a rock and a hard place in what is known as the Castello Marese War. Giuseppe Masseria is aspiring to be the boss of bosses and demanding an expensive, approximately 10 grand tribute from Reyna. Reyna is not really in a position to do that and keep doing it, so he starts to reach out to Maranzano, the other huge pain in the ass of the mustache Pete era. Masseria gets wind of it and murders Reyna. Hence appointing his man Joseph Pinzolo to lead the family, Masseria's way. This goes unappreciated by up-and-comers Gatano Gagliano and Gatano Lucchese, who feel the gang is theirs to inherit and don't appreciate being sidestepped by an outsider. His name's not even Gaetano. <laughs> Pinzolo takes charge of his adopted gang and predictably serves the underworld interests of Masseria over the well-being of the former Reina gang members. To make matters worse, Pinzolo is reportedly a disagreeable sort, and his men soon grow to despise him. According to Luciano, as big a shit as Masseria was, he didn't hold a candle to Pinzolo. That guy was fatter, uglier, and dirtier than Masseria was on the worst day when the old bastard didn't take a bath, which was most of the time. Uh, Charlie might have been in a bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, last week, I, I, when I went back and heard the podcast, I said some unkind things about uh, Angela Lansbury. Oh, yeah. I got nothing against her. I, <laughs> I, I liked her. You know, I don't know what was wrong with me. <laughs> and I was as happy as anyone when Chummy found love ahead of her prettier and more demure friends. I just want to get that on the record. <laughs> The discontentment of the gang has been festering, and the chaos of the Castel Marese War has lent itself to a culture of lawlessness. It doesn't take long for things to deteriorate. In September of 1930, Pinzolo is lured to an office rented by Lucchese on Broadway in Manhattan. Here he is shot five times, officially by unidentified gunmen. Unofficially, the gunmen were Petrilli, Bobby Doyle, and or possibly even Lucchese himself. Wasn't Bobby Doyle on, uh... Boardwalk Empire. I feel like I know that name, Bobby Doyle. Did you see Boardwalk? Uh-uh. Uh, he was a jackass on that. It's like, so, so I think he was Irish. He had changed his name. and yeah, I'm pretty sure that was him. Bobby Doyle. Uh, you couldn't wait for him to get shot in the head. And it, took, <laughs> it took years. Lucchese is indicted for the crime, but the charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence. Giuseppe Masseria apparently attributes the killing to rival Castello Marese boss Salvatore Maranzano. While there's no specific mention of uh, Corallo in these stories, a lot of them, he is with these guys, at least loosely, and he's a young teen. So this is the kind of stuff he's growing up with, and he learns three hard lessons. A, you can make a lot of money by manipulating legitimate business practices like they did with the ice. Uh, B, you can use physical force and murder if necessary to insert yourself into the activities of lesson A. And C, being the top dog in a gang is not always the most desirable position. It's not only lonely at the top, it's dangerous. That's the most important role to me, that a lot of these guys never realize. They always want to be the boss of bosses, but that puts such a target on your back. And even though, yeah, and you see how he portrays himself, and he, he doesn't make himself the uh, headline guy. By the time 1935 rolls around, Corallo has become a member of the Gagliano crime family, as Reyna, now a corpse, is deemed unfit to lead. The family, which will eventually become the Lucchese crime family, 
is noted for its heavy involvement in the racketeering business and influence over labor unions throughout the city. And we've kind of covered the unions and stuff with Anastasia. And uh, this is where the mob is brilliant. They invent unions where unions didn't even exist. And where unions do exist, they get in. They worm their way in. They put their guys at the top. They have the secretaries. They get everybody in the staff becomes theirs and they control it. Now they control labor. They can take a piece of the labor dues. You know, and initially that's the way I was always thinking it was. They're just taking your money and giving nothing in return. But it's far worse than that. They're going to get the contracts. They're going to decide who makes the money. They're going to raise the price of everything. If the union you know, would have been 10 bucks, it's now 20 bucks. And there's plenty to go around and the families are all in cahoots with it. But once they get their fingers in there, they are in and you can't get them out. Under Gagliano's watch, the family retains its reign over labor unions and rackets, while also becoming more known for its peaceful and low-key manner of operating. By keeping their activities contained to the Bronx and Manhattan areas, as well as New Jersey, the family is able to keep out of the law enforcement spotlight for the most part. Gagliano family underboss Tommy Lucchese recruits Corallo to work with fellow mobster Johnny Dio the feared and revered leader of the labor racketeering operations in the Garment District of Manhattan. A foul-mouthed and terrifying man, Corallo is often used by Lucchese to enforce debtors into meeting payments and to resolve labor disputes. A really bad glare from Anthony Corallo was often all that was necessary. Corallo learns the ins and outs of the labor racketeering schemes of the family and becomes more familiar with the illegal operations, one being the scandalous paper local unions. Okay, so a paper local is a bullshit union with few or no actual members. It's basically set up for the purpose of criminal activity. Its name essentially means existing only on paper. In cases where paper locals do have members, the members are not real workers. They're just friends, family members, criminal associates of the thugs that control the paper local. So paper locals are, of course, denounced by the Code of Ethical Practices. They're often uh, used as a means of extorting money. The guys that run a paper local may threaten to unionize an employer, uh, his workers, unless they get a payoff. The paper local may even list the workers at a work site as members and accept the payment as union dues, when in fact the workers know squat about forming or joining a union. They haven't paid any dues, and they definitely do not receive the benefits of collective bargaining and things you'd normally associate with a union. Okay. So paper locals often enter into like sweetheart contracts that are grossly unfair to workers. And then the employer and a paper local embezzle money from the business. And one uh, infamous example, a paper local and an employer entered into a contract in which the workers, they could only take one holiday off each year. So they made it Passover. Okay. Nobody was Jewish. <laughs> so they got no paid off days off. It's that bad. Right? Oh, wow. So that's that's what a paper local is. It's like a fake union that just rips off people in ways that it, it, it's unimaginable. But it's it's brilliant at the same time. What these guys can do, you know, is just stunning. They'll they'll make money everywhere. If they yeah, they'll sniff out a way to make money. I, you I, you got to give them credit. If they if there's a dime to be scraped, they have scraped it. But all these guys, and this is like the stuff I'm seeing constantly, especially when it comes to Tony Ducks, they're like, he could have made it in anything. He didn't have to do this. Like, But for some reason, this is what they're drawn to. You know? Yeah. Price tag's hard to turn down. But they're saying he could have made the money. They're like, this guy was smart enough that he would have gone in any major organization and, and found ways to make money. It didn't. He didn't have to crack heads, you know? <laughs> it could be that power trip. There's... That's what it is. I mean, that's all it is. And the money. That fear, that power you can get in the mob is to walk into an establishment and everyone, like, averts their eyes or no one will say anything to you, cross you. Is, and he's you know, in it when he's seven. Yeah. So maybe he never even had yeah, a chance. Yeah, they say he could have done anything, but when you're seven and your brain is formed to that lifestyle, yeah. could you have done anything? I mean. Yeah, these are the guys you admire, I guess. Yeah, he I wasn't mean, looking up to bankers or accountants he was looking up to <laughs> the mobsters during the teamsters paper local scandal a crusading newspaper columnist named victor riesel championed the call to justice and paid a heavy price at 3 a.m on april 5th 1956 riesel is leaving a deli called lindy's presumably having completed an interview there 
As he is exiting the establishment, ready to call it a night, he's approached by an unknown assailant. The assailant throws a vial of acid ah! in Riesel's face as he steps outside. Damn, that must burn. The attack leaves the journalist permanently blind. The FBI later identifies Abraham Telvey as the assailant in August 1956, but by that time, Telvey is dead, having been murdered on July 28, 1956. Yeah, um, getting the acid burn in your face, I mean, it sounds like bacon frying, you know, you, get, you feel for the guy. We'd help him, but we can't. This happened a long time ago, and uh, <laughs> it's nature's way. Telvey is paid $500 for the acid shower right mm -hmm. but he soon realizes it was a bigger job than he bargained for it's making the paper it's drawing a bunch of heat so he gets the bright idea to renegotiate he demands an additional fifty thousand dollars for services already rendered <laughs> so the Lachese family counters his offer by killing him <laughs> we paid you five hundred dollars and he comes back you want fifty grand and we With raise 50, you a gunshot or I'm gonna tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a classic case we see over and over where these people really don't have any idea who they're dealing with. No, they, they don't. And I don't know how many more stories you have to hear. You were know. just hired to throw acid <laughs> in a man's face. And you're like, no, well, they'll probably be reasonable to my negotiation tactics. Don't yeah, me they, out. He wrote one hit piece on a clearly illegal act and they made you throw acid in his face. And wow. you're going to ask for 50 grand. <laughs> in the Lucchese's defense, he wrote several hit pieces. No, that's good. Right. Right. And, he, and he was asked to stop. So, <laughs> was okay. asked. Okay. That, that brings me to the natural question. Yeah. Would you rather have the acid thrown in your face and be blinded that way? Or would you rather be blinded by the Dutchman with a gonorrhea-soaked bandage wrapped around your eyes? I'm going acid. Hard, hard acid. Yeah, I'm going acid too because uh, I don't have to ask where the acid came from. Might get a cool <laughs> scar, wear some sunglasses, tell a much more interesting story. Maybe I only go blind in one eye. You know, maybe he misses and it's both. It's both. Right, it's both. Right. You're getting your, you're completely blind. I'm taking the acid. Yeah. Yeah. Your face is melted off. Yeah. But you're blind either way. I feel like you got a cooler story to make up with the acid. At least if my face is melted off, I can't see it. Ray Charles is blind, but he still got the women. If you get the <laughs> acid bath, you can forget that. It could be a, it's, it's, his, it's his villain origin story. Because <laughs> he gets <laughs> the acid thrown on his face. Gosh darn it, I'm going with the gonorrhea. Oh, <laughs> Phil. It was the best blinding I could have got. <laughs> On August 29, 1956, Diaguardi is arrested for conspiracy in the Riesel attack, pleads not guilty, and is released on a $100,000 bond, even though prosecutors later publicly link him to the Telvey murder. In 1941, Corallo is handed his first prison sentence after being found in possession of a narcotics cash worth approximately 150 grand, a cash that surely belonged to a friend of Corallo's. All things considered, Carlo gets off easy and is sentenced to six months jail time on Rikers Island. It's Carlo's first conviction after five charges of robbery, one charge of grand larceny, two charges of vagrancy, and one outlandish charge of consorting with criminals since 1929. From 1941 to 1960, none of the charges stick. After one of these many avoidances, Lucchese muses Tony Ducks again. From then on, Anthony Corallo is known as Tony Ducks. In 1943, Corallo is impressively appointed as the capo regime of his own crew. Corallo is clearly heavily trusted within the family as it is highly unusual for a man in his early 30s to be named capo. Corallo's first order of business is to move his headquarters from his native East Harlem to Queens. Together with Johnny Dio, Carlo controls five local chapters of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Using feeble paper locals to set up quote-unquote fair deals with trucking companies, Carlo and Dio seek to exploit the rank-and-file members of the chapter. The two gangsters also have their hands on the local chapters of the Conduit Workers Union, now known as the Communication Workers Union, the United Textile Workers Union, now called the Unite Here, and the Brotherhood of Painters and Decorators, now called the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. 
Did Tony Ducks ever paint anything in his life? I heard he painted certain parts of a wall red from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Through these labor rackets, Dio and Corolla raked in millions of dollars for the Gagliano family. In 1951, the Gagliano family comes under new leadership upon Gagliano's death. Tony Ducks' trusted ally, Tommy Lucchese, whose loyalty to the family and Gagliano is unwavering, is chosen to take over the family as boss. Gagliano died of natural causes. In 1958, U.S. Senator John McClellan, leading a Senate committee investigating crime and the labor movement, states, Our study into the New York situation reveals an alarming picture of the extent to which gangsters like Anthony Corallo have infiltrated the labor movement, using their union positions for the purposes of extortion, bribery, and shakedowns. Tony Corallo is one of the scariest and worst gangsters we've ever dealt with. On August 15, 1959, Corallo is brought forward to testify before the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor and Management. Needless to say, the Senators are more than familiar with Corallo and his rackets. The committee questions Tony Ducks for nearly two hours of interrogation, wanting him to explain how 70 grand was stolen from Teamsters Union Local 239 by using names of dead mobsters. Like many of his fellow mobsters, Corallo refused to answer the good senator's questions, invoking the Fifth Amendment right an unbelievable 120 times during the testimony. So 60 times an hour he's invoking the Fifth Amendment. That must have been fun. Uh, <laughs> at that point, it's just like a technicality. You're just asking the questions for the sake of it because you know he's going to... Just to get it on the record. By like what? Is it by the 20th time where like, all right, he's... It's just a rattling off the questions. <laughs> Did you know this person? I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. Yeah. I plead the fifth. <laughs> well, there's actually an interesting story behind that. I plead the fifth. <laughs> Two years later, in 1961, Tony Ducks is unable to avoid an indictment on charges of bribery. In an attempt to get a bankruptcy fraud charge against one of his associates dropped, Carlo tries to bribe New York Supreme Court Justice J. Vincent Coe and former U.S. Attorney Elliot Kanaher. On June 17th of the following year, Tony Ducks is convicted of bribery and sentenced to two years in state prison. Upon Corallo's release from prison, the reign of his friend Lucchese does not last long. The dawn of the family died of a brain tumor in July 67, and by all accounts, Tony Ducks has been hand-picked by the late crime lord to take over operations. Only five months after ascending to the throne, Corallo is pinched on charges of receiving a kickback payment for the renovation of the Jerome Park Reservoir in the Bronx. Going down with Corallo on the charges is former City Water Commissioner James L. Marcus, who has been forced into business with Tony Ducks due to his loan sharking debts to the boss. On June 19th of the following year, Corallo is convicted on the bribery charges and sentenced to three years in federal prison, making this his second bribery conviction in seven years. Speaking of going down with uh, Tony Ducks, uh, he also formed the International Union of Prison Rapists. No, he didn't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> Jeez. So I had to throw that in. You said it like it was real. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> Upon his imprisonment, interim control of the Lucchese family shifted over to Carmine Tremonti, who was later indicted in the French Connection case. Although short-lived, many historians have speculated as to whether or not Tremonti was only an acting boss, or rather, had taken Corallo's spot as official boss of the family. However, in six years' time, it wouldn't matter. In 1973, three years after Corallo's release from prison, Tremonti was put away for 15 years in a federal prison. With one swift motion of the law, Tony Ducks is now the undisputed boss of the Lucchese crime family. Almost immediately, Tony Ducks makes his move on the gravel industry, taking over various distribution areas around the city, including Long Island. It's through the gravel business that Corallo begins to take a stranglehold on the construction industry in New York City. Next, in a Tony Soprano-esque maneuver, Tony Ducks moves in on the garbage industry, forming a front business named the Private Sanitation Industry Association, with the help of union official Bernie Adelstein. Then, Corallo teams up with Lucchese family capo Paul Verio, who's the inspiration for Polly Cicero and Goodfellas, to take more control and authority at John F. Kennedy International Airport. 
What better way to usher in the 1980s decade than by incriminating yourself? By using undercover informant Robert Kubeka, the owner of a Suffolk County garbage hauling business, the New York State Organized Crime Task Force gathers extensive essential evidence against Corallo as well as Salvatore Avellino, the right-hand man and chauffeur to Tony Ducks. Okay, so Robert Kubeka has a long story with the mob. He's the son of Jerry Kubek, who was a milkman a generation before, and he's driving around in his milk truck delivering milk, and people are asking him as a favor to haul their trash away. He's like, yeah, I'll haul your trash. And he's doing it as a favor, right? Mm-hmm. So this is becoming a thing, and maybe they start paying him or whatever, and uh, he starts to get a good thing going. This is way back in the day when the feds or somebody found out that he's uh, putting trash in with his milk, and it's a no-no. So they shut him down, right? <laughs> So people are like, well, damn, who's going to take my trash away? So he goes out and he buys like a fertilizer flatbed truck. And, I, and he's got a moonlighting business now delivering uh, trash, taking trash away and stuff. And uh, it takes off. He ends up getting more trucks and uh, he's he's expanding. He's getting into the trash business. Entrepreneur. Right. right. So trash. Jerry soon learns that there are unions and organizations in place that are fixing the trash business even way back then. So they start leaning on him for this and that, and he doesn't budge. He's often going to the police and reporting shakedowns. But then when they want him to be a witness or testify, he doesn't want to do anything like that. He knows better, right? He doesn't want to take on the mob. So he remains a little bit of a thorn in the side to the Gambino and the Lucchese family. Somehow survives. They never do uh, corrupt him, and they never take him down. So when he hits retirement age, he leaves the business to his son, Robert, who recruits his brother-in-law, Donald Barstow. And the boys inherit more than a trash business. They inherit a war with the criminal underworld. It's just as he's hanging the keys up on the wall, he goes, Oh, and I should mention, <laughs> you're in a massive underworld uh, war with the Gambino and the Lucchese family. But it's your problem. Now. Good luck. I-, I put that at the top of your list. <laughs> with the change in leadership, Tony Ducks and company tried to intimidate the son out of the business, having failed abysmally with the father. Kubeka is subjected to extensive harassment and mockery at the hands of Corallo, but remains unwilling to participate in the mob-controlled waste hauling business. Some of Kubeka's trucks are damaged, fires are started in the company's dumpsters, and customers are warned that they themselves will become victims if they continue to use Kubeka's services. Robert complained to his family that he's being followed, that his men are being accosted and threatened, their parked cars vandalized when left outside the workplace. He begins to sleep over in the office and keep watch over the yard at nights. Fully aware that his father has been dealing with this problem for years, Robert is prepared to do more than complain about the problem. In 1980, Kubeka and Barstow sit down with a man named Dick Tenian, who is a special investigator for the Organized Crime Task Force of the State Attorney General's office. He is encouraging them to carry on with their business, even to expand it further provoking the mob. He assures them that he's a professional, and that the two men will enjoy the protection of New York State if they agree to help. He further assures them that they are part of a larger team of informants, and that their names will never be released or used in a court of law. The two men go out as instructed, aggressively bidding for contracts with private and public utilities, and over the next two years they help produce evidence that allows the task force to get court permission for wiretaps and electronic bugs. These surveillances reveal the role of Salvatore Avellino Jr., whose name keeps popping up like a turd in a punch bowl. He's the president of Private Sanitation, runs a multi-million dollar garbage business called Salem Sanitary Carding Company, and is also a capo in the Lucchese family. He's also the driver of one Tony Ducks Corallo. Finally, in the summer of 1983, Ducks and family try a different tactic. They try to buy them out, using a man named Fred Lamangino to approach them with the offer. The offer includes a mandatory 3% commission that is to be paid to Avellino. Lamangino assures them that if the buyout is rejected, they will ultimately meet with some unfortunate tragedy. The two men are not intimidated, feeling secure in the protection of law enforcement. In the fall of 1983, the state prosecutors prepare their case for a grand jury hearing, and the two good Samaritans find that although their testimony will be secret, if it is to go to trial, they will have to appear as witnesses. They also discover that the network of informants Dick Tenian has in place are only themselves and that there was never anyone else. In September 1984, 
The grand jury indicts 21 people and 16 carding companies on Long Island, alleging that the Gambino and Lucchese families are divvying up over 400 grand each year from the industry through extortion, restraint of trade, and brute force. According to federal sources, cash skimmed from the waste haulers is divided between the Lucchese family because they oversee the division of collection routes and the Gambino family who prevent labor problems through their control over unionized garbage workers. Among the defendants indicted are Avellino, Tony Dux Corallo, and his underboss, Salvatore Santoro. From the New York Times article following Corallo's death. According to Ronald Goldstock, the former director of the New York State Organized Crime Task Force, who spent nearly a year listening to the secret tapes from Mr. Avellino's car, Mr. Corallo never really became acclimated to the flashier world of the mob that emerged in the late 80s. At the time he ascended, Mr. Goldstock said, bosses tended to be insulated, prison sentences were fairly minimal, and people who rose to his level were tested. They were trained and they were proven. But by the time the 80s rolled around, everything had changed. The new people didn't grow out of the gangs of Little Italy or Brooklyn. They were untested and untrained. According to federal wiretap transcripts, Mr. Avellino once told his boss that they were being followed in the car, probably because the authorities believed that Mr. Corallo controlled the toxic waste disposal industry. Mr. Corallo gave a simple response. They're right, he said. Although unable to get close enough to Avellino himself, information gathered up by Quebeca persuades a judge to permit a wiretap on Avellino's home in New York. The wiretap does not prove to be as fruitful as the agents would have liked but it does confirm that Avellino is, in fact, Corallo's trusted driver. Casually driving around the city discussing essential topics such as the internal structure of the Lucchese family, the history of the organization, and their relations with rival crime families, Corallo and company unwittingly supply authorities with all the information they'll need for an eventual indictment. Using an electronic surveillance device that was installed in Avellino's dashboard while he was enjoying a dinner dance with his wife, the New York State Organized Crime Task Force shares these incriminating conversations with federal prosecutors, leading to the infamous Mafia Commission trial. So this is where uh, I'm going back to Fear City. And uh, as we're studying this, it kind of clicks because I saw Fear City a while back. We talked about it way back uh, Anastasia. But when you're talking about, talking about the wiretaps and stuff, I'm like, wait a minute, I know this story. So I grabbed Joshua, the intern, with the remote control, and I'm having him like fast forward and stop and stuff as I'm kind of jotting the notes and stuff. So uh, we get the, this whole story of the wiretap. So bear with me. So according to Frank O'Hara, who's on the Organized Crime Task Force, Avalino drives a black four-door Jaguar. He's considered the industry specialist in the garbage collection rackets. He's also the driver for Tony Ducks. The first obstacle in placing a bug in the Jaguar is convincing a judge to issue a warrant. This will require probable cause. Special Agent Lynn DeVecchio of the FBI rounds up some informants and asks them if Tony discusses family business with Avellino in the car. Multiple snitches allegedly say yes, and that's enough for the judge, right? So now they're going to place a bug in Avellino's car. But it's not as easy as it sounds. He is always in the car, or it is secured, if not guarded, all the time. Whatever they do, they're going to have to do it incredibly quiet and really, really fast. So their first move is they get an identical Jaguar to his. Wow. They go through the manual. They figure out possible places they could hook this up and, and, and hook it to the battery. Then they drive it around and they see how well it records in different things. Like they may fit it in one place good, but the fan is too loud or the engine's too loud and stuff. They figure out, it's like behind the dashboard, somewhere near the heater, they figure out is the perfect place, okay? So now they've got where it's gonna go. They get a stopwatch and they get the best technicians and mm -hmm. they gotta practice getting in the car, taking out the dashboard, taking out the pieces, hooking up the thing, Jeez. getting it back in, putting it back in, right? And they do it again and again and again and again until they've got this down. I don't know the exact time, but I want to say they can do it in about a minute and a half, a minute and 45 seconds. Done. They're out, Jeez. right? So they get that going. It's like impossibly fast, okay? Okay, now they need the right moment. So they're following him around, and there's always somebody watching. They're, I think it's about a week or two weeks they're following him around looking for the right time. So you mentioned this dinner dance thing. Yeah. So he goes there. 
it is pouring down rain, like just buckets, okay? And he's parked kind of far back because I guess he gets to this thing late. So he's parked a little bit far back, so this is kind of their time. He's parked inside a chain link parking lot, and the chain link fence is locked, right? Yeah. And two guys reportedly are standing I've gotten two different accounts of this, but uh, besides just Fear City, but two guys are standing kind of like in the patio area watching the car, yeah. okay? But then the rain just gets nuts, and two guys go, eh, screw it, nobody's out here, let's go in for a second. So they go in, there's more than one car, right? He wires them in, he's like, go. So one guy's watching the restaurant to make sure nobody's coming. These guys take a bolt cutter, they cut the chain, get in, they've got a key that Jaguar gave them. So they've got the key to his car. Yeah. They pop it open. They've got plastic. This guy's holding up plastic over because it's soaking wet. Yeah. They get in, lay plastic down, in and out. Went up like minute 30, minute 45. They put the bug in. They're not even sure it'll work, you know, but they think they got it. Yeah. Wipe down the car. Make sure there's not a drop of water. Lock it. They get back out, hook up the fence, and they're gone. So nobody uh, knows they're there. It's like NASCAR pit crew speed. It's, it's, it's really, really, really That's cool. a good – we talk of – We've talked before about movie scenes would be really that would lend itself. That's an intense moment in a yeah. movie. And you it see was. him go away. Yeah. They're putting it in. They're like they look up. Maybe like the door opens from the building. Like like trying to beat the clock. Type maybe a mess with it, and he's actually coming. Yeah, it's like walking towards him. Yeah, man, they mess up. Maybe like in the movie in the movie version, he drops one of the tools to tie it in. Can't find it for a second. Like. It'd be intense. Yeah, it was pretty cool. They're just getting started. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so now the bug's in there. Okay, and the way the bug's going to work is it's going to transmit, and they've got a van that records the signal. But these mob guys are smart, right? They know if a van's following them. These guys ride the rearview mirror all the time. So they're like saying, he's going to see us if we're following him around in a van. Yeah. And they do tricks like uh, the mob guys. They'll go around a block three times a short block mm -hmm. just to see if they recognize any of the same cars and they've got to stay close so what they end up doing is they get four cars that are different makes different models different colors and what they have them in is called a repeater it picks up the signal and transmit it further so the van can stay a block two blocks away but this still has to be coordinated and they're even saying like the gangsters have uh, tricks like if they're driving too fast their buddy's like hey man why are you going so fast go slow and you'll see them more if you're slow. So the monsters will drive real slow. So if you're following them, like, they're going to spot you and yeah. stuff. So he's, like, saying, like, sometimes you got to, you, you don't want to get too many cars between, but sometimes you got to. He goes, sometimes they'll take a fast corner, right? So you get behind a red light and stuff and their car's in front of you. He goes, we got to go real easy up onto the sidewalk and you got to stay on them. So you got to do this stuff, right? Now they're like, thank God Avellino really didn't do a lot of that stuff, like especially the driving around the block stuff. He goes, you know, yeah. thank God he, he didn't do much of that. So yeah. they had a pretty easy time. So now they're getting some of the conversations and it's coming in loud and clear. Some of the conversations they heard, I kind of jotted down and the guy sounds like Joe Pesci. I mean, it's like, it is the spit image of Joe Pesci when you heard it. But he goes, you cannot be in the narcotics business and stick it in your effing stomach. You can't be in the junk business without going in the effing streets and sewing it in the expletive streets. We'll kill anybody who dare come near us. You know we'll kill them. <laughs> and when we say break the guy's balls, we're here at 7 in the morning and we're breaking the guy's balls. Everything's going according to plan, right? Until Avellino goes on vacation for a couple days. So they're waiting it out. When he gets in his car, the car won't start. They've got this thing hooked to the battery. The bug killed the battery. Uh. So Avellino's like getting pissed off and he's on the phone and he's like, take this freaking thing back. You guys, there's an electrical problem. Tear this thing through, figure out what the hell's wrong oh, and fix man. it once and for all. The feds are like, oh shit. Yeah. Cause you know, he's, they're taking it to their guys. They're yeah. not going to Midas. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Uh, I'm sure there's a uh, mechanics union that they go to, right? <laughs> yeah. So they don't know what to do. This Definitely flatbed is. tow truck comes. They take the Jag, right? goes down. So they get a uniformed officer to pull over the, the tow truck. And uh, it's, it's intense. As luck will have it, the guy driving the tow truck has a suspended license. Right? Ah. So the cab's jacking him up and jacking him around while the technician sneaks up the back, gets in the Jag, and gets the bug out of the Jag. 45 seconds Jeez. he's back out of the car 
right? So I guess it's easier to take out. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so then it goes, it gets fixed. I'm sure the guys are like, there's nothing wrong with this car, man. He just let the battery die, you know, whatever. So he gets the car back. Now they got to get the bug back in. This time it's easier. He picks up Tony Ducks and he goes to this little diner and he parks like three spaces out, right? They get this big black delivery truck. They pull in between the car and the restaurant. It blocks the view. The guys are in and out. The buck's back in. Nice. So they're, they're back in. They get more conversations after that. He gets, when we control the men, we control the bosses even better now. Now they're even more effing afraid. They control the associations, the unions, the whole garbage industry. There's no competition. If someone didn't cooperate with the system, they get killed. Now, when a guy steps out of line, you got the whip. <laughs> Okay. So at this point, these guys say they had as many as 25 bugs at one time just in the Lucchese crime family. Jeez. And you know, like all the work they go through, the repetition of the bug, praying, praying a sliver of information gets left out. And they're sitting there waiting and they're just vomiting information and they can't believe it, I'm, I'm sure, just eating it up, just writing everything down they can't believe oh and they're the listening there's people going around the clock this lady was saying she listens over and over and over and has to like and it's some of it's a, you know you got to pick out what they're saying and stuff she goes it was her first time in this kind of line of work and she's like they did uh, more creative use of the f word than i would have ever imagined in my life. i didn't even know it could be used that way <laughs> In the ways they were using redefining the language <laughs> yeah but i bet when you're busted and you're going they're going they're showing you that there's like 3500 pages of shit you said yeah you're like oh i can't believe i said all that the worst Dude. one you read was uh we'll kill him you know we will <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know you know we're gonna kill him he knows it i know it you know it he's a dead man that's one of those they say it in the courtroom and you just put your head down you're just like yeah they got me I can tell you, just just when I edit this podcast, some of the shit we say, you know, I'm like, my God, we can't we can't have that on. Jeez, I yeah. can only imagine what these guys did. The, like, the lawyer of these mobsters, like when the the reading it verbatim in court, and the lawyer just like is looking over, he's like, "What do you want me to do?" The uh, lawyer yeah. just opens his briefcase and blows his own head off. <laughs> like, he just starts putting all his notes back in the briefcase. He's like, it's, it's closed. The case is closed. I better not get want. whacked over losing this case. Uh, yeah. This you is on, it to yourself. It's on you. <laughs> yeah, a mob lawyer is too much stress for me. Yeah. yeah. No thanks. He's like, did you even try <laughs> to not get yourself caught? What was it, the untouchables, when Capone just punches his lawyer at the yeah. end of it? <laughs> He just jacks him right in the face. <laughs> we'll kill him. You know we will. That's just damning. Now, the interesting thing about Fear City is when he's talking about meeting those informants and how discreet you got to be and stuff, he never once mentioned him by name. Wow. The charges are handed down on Corallo and other prominent members of the New York organized crime community, including Paul Castellano and Anthony Salerno, in a trial that lasts from February 1985 to November 1986. When the charges are delved out on February 25th of 86, Carlo is not arrested immediately as he's in the hospital. Upon his release, the cuffs are slapped on the Lucchese family Don, along with his underboss Salvatore, Tom Mick Santoro, and Christopher Christy Tick Fernari. Yeah, we were talking about those nicknames a little bit. That's not great. <laughs> not everybody gets blessed with a Teflon Don. No, that's a great one. Yeah. He, he, sometimes you get a bad, a bad nickname. Tom Mix. Remember when they used to call me the meat hook? <laughs> <laughs> or gunner? <laughs> they still call me gunner. <laughs> In the spring of 85, Robert Kubeka is getting so concerned for his and his family's safety that he writes into the task force demanding some assurances. A lawyer, George Bradlow, who replies on their behalf, states, I can assure you that this office is most sensitive to such considerations and will continue as it has in the past, to provide Mr. Kubeka with any appropriate protection when and if the need arises. On October 6, Robert calls in the office, speaking to Tenian's partner, Alvin Jones, reporting that someone has rung him at the depot, saying, Watch out for your family and friends this weekend. While awaiting the commission trial, Tony Ducks holds a meeting at Frenari's home, where he arranges for either Vittorio Vicamuzo, the capo of Frenari's old crew, or Frenari's aide de comp. Anthony Gaspipe Casso to succeed him as Don. 
It's ultimately decided that Amuzo will take the reins of the Lucchese family. You know, if you know anything about Gasfied Caso, it's definitely, you definitely went the right route picking the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think Gasfied would have lasted long. Didn't know it then, but I made the right call. <laughs> On November 19th, 86, Tony Dux Corallo is found guilty of numerous racketeering charges and is sentenced to 100 years in prison, along with a hefty $240,000 fine. I'm sure after hearing the 100 years, the 240 grand doesn't register. <laughs> According to Tom Jones of Gangsters, Inc., August 10th, 1989 is sunny and warm even before the sun rises. Robert Kubeka and Donald Barstow are at their office in the red brick building as early as usual, and their 10 trucks are out on the road by 5.15 a.m. The friends are working in the office when two vehicles drive up and park quietly in the empty street. By now it's about 6 a.m. and two killers check their guns before walking coolly into the office building. They catch Donald Barstow in the hallway and blast him to death. In the small cramped office with Kubeka, it doesn't go down so easily. Although he has a pistol, it's locked away in the office safe, but Robert wrestles with the two men and there is a massive struggle. Shots are fired wildly, bullets gouging into the office walls and ricocheting off the refrigerator standing in the corner. Furniture is overturned and files and papers are knocked to the floor. They leave Robert slumped over his desk, but in their haste to exit, they forget a black duffel bag containing two guns on the floor in the corner of the office. They also leave a pool of blood that is theirs, not Robert's. The mob has tried to intimidate him for 12 years without success, and even when they send their hired guns to eliminate him, Quebec goes down fighting. The two men rush out of the building, and Barada follows Carmine Avellino, who takes them to a safe house, where they wait until it's clear for them to return to their respective homes, one of them badly injured. Although grievously injured himself, Robert is able to dial 911, telling the operator, I've been shot. Two people have been shot. Send help. When the police arrive, they find him still slumped across his desk. Rushed to Huntington Hospital, he is able to tell investigators that his attacker was a white man in his 40s before he dies later that morning of gunshot wounds. The killers had not realized that the other man was not Jerry Kubeka. He and his son had been the targets. The day after the killings, a newspaper report indicated that the authorities had urged the men to enter the witness protection program and change their identities. The source claimed that Donald had been offered every kind of aid in starting over again, but had refused. Another source close to the state task force claimed that somewhere, sometime, they were sure somebody in the mob would deal with the Quebecas. Donald's wife Kathy and Nina were outraged. They claimed their husbands had been committed to the project, had trusted the feds, had never been offered a refuge in the witness protection program, and had been abandoned by the authorities. They took their grievances to court and the law agreed with them and found the two men had been cast adrift by the law. In July 1998, Judge Leonard Silverman awarded the widows $10.8 million in damages. Dick Tenian, the OCTF supervisor who promised Robert and Donald all the protection in the world, died in April 2001. He was eulogized at the funeral as a pioneer in the investigation of organized crime. His partner, Alvin Jones, the man Robert spoke to the day before he was murdered, retired to Queens. When asked about the case, he simply said, The deaths touched me very deeply. I have put it behind me. Jerry Kubeka, Robert's father, also died in 2001. On August 23, 2000, in a world often void of justice, Anthony Tony Dux Corallo dies of natural causes at the Federal Medical Center in Springfield, Missouri, never getting what he certainly had coming. This concludes the legend of Anthony Tony Dux Corallo. So, uh, Quebecca, you know, obviously it really sucks what happened to him. Uh, it's even worse, in my opinion, like, they're patting themselves on the back in Fear City. And I, and I like the show. I don't want to be too hard on it. But as me and Joshua, the intern, are going through, we're looking for stuff to gather on Tony Ducks. There's no mention of these guys. And uh, as I'm watching it, for it can't be a second or two seconds, they show a TV clip when they're referring to mob violence. And I don't always take them for, uh, uh, for being 100% accurate because they talk about how mob informers are killed and stuff. And they had a picture of Masseria. Like he's holding the ace of spades and stuff. I'm like, that's not a mob informant. So, so they kind of, they do a little shaky stuff, you know. But uh, 
they show a television of a news thing and you can hear the news lady really quickly say a shooting at a trash thing and I'm like and I go back so Joshua rewinds it we watch it a few times and I'm like they're saying people are dry they're dragging bodies out of a trash thing what's that because they haven't mentioned it right yeah. so I get on I start doing search engines for like were trash workers shot in the 1980s guess who I find Quebec right and I'm like this is the first I'm hearing of it I'm like they were shot like he's an informant and then I'm going back like they never mentioned this guy and they never mentioned that he was killed right yeah. so he got him the wiretaps he trusted him and he was killed right and he was totally betrayed by these guys he was hung out to dry the best kind of thing. so you would think even in Fear City as a freaking tribute to these guys they would get some kind of they were ignored again and you know it was almost a slap in the face how this little two second blur happened in there and uh, I'm honestly stunned that we picked it up and discovered who they were and we got this whole story yeah. like once I start digging into it you can imagine my elation when I find out Tom Jones wrote about it <laughs> in 2010 and he wrote a really seething blog about it and calling everybody out on yeah, good. what bullshit it was yeah. you know but I kind of feel like it was even insult to injury when they were left out of this again yeah you know i, I don't know maybe there was a lawsuit they or got, something you can't mention them but they got screwed over yeah it, and it seems like they're still getting screwed over. yeah and like i said we've talked about this before like uh you know what was his name arnold schuster yeah like just just go home <laughs> you know what yeah. i mean like, followed him home right the, yeah yeah because it's, you know, like you said, and here you go, they do the right thing and it just doesn't end well because you're not playing on a level playing field. No. You know, these mob guys you're dealing with are, are ruthless, they're scum. And I'm sorry, sometimes the law enforcement you're dealing with are just as ruthless and just as scummy. Yeah. And uh, it makes you wonder, are they really out for justice? Are they out for right and wrong? Or is it a job? It's a career move and they want to win. Yeah. And it seemed like in this case, it was more about we win than we do the right thing or we protect people. And it, it, it's, it's even just one more note. In Fear City, they talk about the death of uh, Castellano mm -hmm. and how bad they feel about that. Because they're like, you know, we just we, we've been following for a long time. We've been dealing with this guy. We just meant for him to go to jail. And I really feel bad that, uh, you know, but who the hell feels bad for for the the poor guy. But the hell with our informants. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Castellano, at least he's in the game. Yeah. Who the hell feels bad for these guys? And it's not like these guys were rats, you know? They weren't with the mob. No, they, they were, were victims. They were yeah. fighting back, defending their livelihoods. Yeah. They're not rats. I mean, you know? and you do know, as long as these guys were on the case in the office, you know some of them thought, I imagine the press, like my name, I brought down so-and-so. Yeah. I brought down this fam Tony Ducks yeah. yeah and I'll use these people up to get there yeah because yeah. you know? that's part of it is like yeah we'll we'll clean up the streets but do the promotion the, the people will adore me my colleagues I'll get such adoration if I bring down this big part of the mob or yeah next thing you know I'm the head of the FBI whatever the hell it is that <laughs> yeah. gives them a gives them a thrill they're always there. looking for their own avenue on their end yeah but you know I feel bad about that and I've put it behind me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've so bad. It's, it's, it's a different part of my you know, life. You know, the death has touched me very deeply, but it's, it's in the past. <laughs> it's in the past. I prefer not to think about it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. It's crazy, too, that we, we talk about the way these guys died. It's like spending 14 years in prison and then dying there. That's looked at as like, oh, we got out of it. Like that's the, I, I think he did. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but that's crazy that that's the the good ending in a way is spending your last fourteen years of your life in prison. Yeah, but he died, you know, like in a comfortable bed with medicine and the yeah, hospital. Yeah, it's like it's either that or getting gunned down, getting yeah. a haircut, yeah. or having lunch and getting riddled with bullets. That's the better alternative in this life. Tony ducks. I guess he technically ducked. Ducked. Yeah, he, he ducked everything. Yeah, yeah. He, he I mean, even, he ducked out nicely. Thinking yeah. about when he could have gone to prison. Yeah, when he could have gotten screwed over way, way earlier. In his when life. he was bribing the Supreme Court judge. Yeah, like that should have been. All right, book him. Yeah, <laughs> send him to prison. So, as far as like being a gangster, do you admire him more, or do you admire somebody like Bugsy, that was out there and lived on the edge and. You know, everybody knows his name. Not everybody knows Tony Ducks. Right. Yeah. Right? I would probably admire Tony Ducks more because I feel like it'd be easy to 
embrace what Bugsy did that life. Remember that scene in have you seen the whole Sopranos yet? No, it's so much of the I've show. I've been on his ass it's for right. years. Bill. It's 2020. We <laughs> oh, can't no. dance around no, it, right? No, don't dance around it. I what mean. was the guy, the old guy that got out of jail? Was like Fiennin or something like that? Feech. Feech. Yeah. Okay. Feech, Feech gets out and he's like, uh, he wants to get back in the rackets and stuff. And he's kind of stepping on Polly's area and mm-hmm. stuff. And he's like, I was in jail and I kept my mouth shut and I, and I entitles me to a piece of the action. You know, and Polly says something to the face like, it entitles you to shit. Yeah. Yeah. Goes, in my book, you get points for staying out of the joint. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird to think, yeah, what do you admire more? The the smart player who, when his back against the wall, he divulged a little bit to get a lesser sense or survived, or the guy that stuck to the guns, kept his mouth shut, but died when he was 32 Yeah, and was gunned down. But he never ratted on his friends, never worked with the feds. Because that lifestyle, you know yourself. We know, looking back, hindsight 2020, we know what they're signing up for. So is it better to look up to the guy that never ratted or the person that kind of looked, took a step back, tried to make the smartest move possible? I'm anti-rat and I got to stay anti-rat. You yeah. know, you chose this life. You knew what it was. You know that you're either going to get shot or you're going to yeah. go to jail. So hello, here it is. Mm-hmm. Time to go to jail. Yeah, I kind of lean that way. And it's a damn good reason not to get into this life. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. There's a good podcast called Mob Talk, and these are the real deals. They're not some schmoes just talking about this shit. They're, they're on the streets, and they, they know their shit. Mm-hmm. But, man, one of them was on there talking the other day, just like, it's a horrible life. I don't wish it on anybody. It sucks. And he was like, he was a rat that got out or yeah. or whatever and stuff. But he was just like, every day he talked about... Uh, just having to sit in a bar all day long. He goes, when the boss is there, you got to be there, or you better have a damn good reason to leave. He goes, sometimes they're there for four days, and there ain't nothing happening, but there's some bug up his ass, and he's just going to make us all stay there. Right. And, you know, and he's just talking. He goes, it's a miserable, miserable life. There's no reason to be in it. There's nothing in it for you. And just a horrible, horrible, horrible life. Yeah. You know, and, so, and if you start making enough money and become a quote-unquote player... Now you're being bucked. Mm-hmm. Now you're being watched. Now you're being followed. So and you now can't you're ever being, relax. Uh, stalked by everybody around you wants a piece of what you got. Yeah, you can't stuff. ever relax. There's always those outliers of a of a lucky Luciano, but that's the one 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 percent. Yeah, I don't know who the next one is, but uh, it seems like the the best days for the mob are gone. They're gone. Very, very much so. All right, aren't we little Miss Mary Sunshine? (laughs) All right, I think it was a pretty good story. We didn't get to kill him in the end, but we killed somebody. Yeah. Yeah. The good guys died. Yeah. He didn't die, but there's plenty of death in the story. (laughs) And a blind man. A man gets blinded. Yeah, there you go. Acid attack. You got another blinding. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, there's a surprising amount of blinding in these things. Yeah. (laughs) If you had listened to our previous pause and you were like, wow, that was pretty crazy. Someone got blinded that way. I wonder if someone else got that. That card. Well, there you go. Apparently, it just files under the uh, category of shit happens. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for what it's worth, uh, the hit team that went after those guys turned out to be Rocco Vitoli, Frank, Frankie Pearl, Federico, and Avelina were all indicted on murder conspiracy. They pleaded down. <laughs> they didn't go down for the murder. They pleaded down to, to nothing, something else. And that's it. All right. I think we're going to call it a night. Josh, we got anything? Make sure to buy Ori Spado's new book, The Accidental Gangster. Uh, what will we do without you? All right. <laughs> have a great night. Thank you for listening to Partners in Crime. This week's episode is an adaptation of several different historical accounts. Music is courtesy of Kevin McLeod. All sources and attribute links can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Partners in Crime Podcast. Links are in the show notes. If you didn't like the show, keep your mouth shut. No one likes a rat.